You're the closest thing I have to family. I love you. You know that. You can never predict what will leave an impact on people. I think writers are always struggling with that fact. Oftentimes the things that stick with a person can be things the creator didn't even think twice about. I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for Bioware. Even with their staffing shakeups over the years and their recent nosedives, they've always had a decent track record for making fun RPGs with interesting characters. More so than the companies that have been lifting from them at any rate. I know their reputation is in the toilet because they haven't released a real game in six years, but their work is always something I find myself coming back to. Even Bioware at their worst gives me something interesting to play. Baldur's Gate remains one of my favorite games series of all time. In fact, it's widely regarded as the best series of RPGs ever made. At its release, it was heralded as a return to form for CRPGs, thanks to the engine being made primarily for Dungeons & Dragons. Unfortunately, that age never really came. Bioware moved on to other projects, and Black Isle took their engine and produced one good game and an ocean of shovelware, and then they promptly abandoned it because of the mandatory shift to 3D that same decade. But this isn't about that. One thing that made Baldur's Gate work was eschewing one of the biggest rules in Dungeons & Dragons and giving the story a main central protagonist. Alongside that protagonist would be a small army of supporting companions, and that is what I want to talk about today. Companion characters are such a staple to the RPG genre at this point that it's weirder when RPGs don't have them, and the current state of RPG companions draws directly from Baldur's Gate and Bioware. It's actually quite rare to find an RPG that doesn't have a supporting cast of characters with their own quests, their own banter dialogue, the possibility for campy romance, their own story outcomes. So much work is put into these companions that they become large chunks of the games themselves. In many RPGs, if you ignored the companion quests, you finish the entire game in like six hours. These characters cost a lot of money to put on screen, so they require attentive detail, backstories longer than a J.K. Rowling book about Twitter, of which you'll get no details of until the final act, and their own personal conflicts that you conveniently are the best person to help them solve. Help, Mass Effect 2 is a game made up entirely of these companion quests, and their completion and success heavily influences how that game ends. These are characters with such huge amounts of personal drama surrounding them that it's almost expected that at this point that when you meet a character in an RPG who seems cagey, it's not just that they're going to have some dramatic backstory, that backstory is going to be so big and so detailed that they're practically the main character of their own book and depending on the game, could have more claim to main character status than the player. And I find that very interesting, because the sheer scale and breadth of these stories is almost completely irrelevant to how effective they end up being as characters. Because the best companion in any CRPG was the one with the least to say, and she's also the first companion most fans of CRPGs will ever remember. Hey, uh, it's me, Emmowen. Wake up, you. Wake up! Come on, we have to get out of here. Ugh, smells like moldy bones down here. You're not going to torture us any longer. A dream of many things, of friends and family. Let someone else take care of the Shining Lady. Please. My best friend is charging into a dragon's mouth, and I'm just sitting here, thinking about magic and stuff. This is the last stand here in hell. We fall, or we win. Emoen as a character is an interesting case study, in part because she wasn't supposed to exist. During the development of Baldur's Gate 1, after giving the game to playtesters, Bioware realized they had filled the early levels with too many evil thieves. So if a player wanted to play good, they were severely hamstringing themselves by not having someone who could search for traps or pick locks. So in late development, they cobbled a character together from recycled voice lines from a different scrapped character entirely, threw in a line about being childhood friends with the player to make them join right away, and, and there you go, you have a good line thief until you reach the later levels to pick one of the real characters, and she ended up being one of the most popular and beloved characters in the entire fucking series. Imolin's popularity was a surprise to everyone because this was a character they threw together in about seven minutes on a Tuesday morning and whose voice actress was completely unaware she was being credited for it. Imolin's sole defining character trait is that the player is her best friend for life. They grew up together, they were the only kids in Candlekeep after all, and despite having seen how dangerous Saravok is with her own eyes, she's gonna stick right beside you as you walk into the jaws of death for vengeance. Oh. Oh, just make me cry, why don't you, you loyal bastard? Yeah, it doesn't actually take much to see why Emoen was so beloved, just off that blurb alone. Sure, all your companions will, in the end, come with you into the depths of hell, but Emoen's the only one who is ride or die from the word go for no other reason than because the two of you have been best friends since you were little. And damn it, she's not letting you walk into that hellscape alone. This is probably the best first impression a companion could ever have. Coming right off a traumatic event, having your best friend turned out to have followed you and saying, I'm with you no matter what. That's great. That's a 
amazing. That's comforting. The sequel really ran with this, as Imoen is the only character in the game who won't leave the party based on reputation. You can be as evil as you want, she'll stick by you no matter what, because she just loves you that much. She says it as much herself. You're the closest thing I have to family. I love you. You know that. Imoen's close bond with the protagonist, though understated because she was always given the short end of the stick writing-wise, is a big part of what made her so beloved. People often lament the fact that she doesn't have a whole lot of banter dialogue, but I'd argue this actually works in her favor. Imoen's lack of dialogue with other characters always makes her feel much closer to the player character, especially given that she's the only companion who is literally only here for you and you alone. Sure, all of them come to care for you and will stand by your side in hell to get your soul back from Irenicus for pretty much no reason other than because they like you, but Imoen starts at that point and stays there the entire game. The beauty of it is that all of this is unsaid. Hell, it wasn't even intended. In an interview with IGN, writer Luke Chrysanson practically admitted that these were patterns the players saw themselves, entirely off the back of the fact that Imoen's lack of interaction with other characters made her relationship with the players seem closer. You could call this an accident, but it's telling just how much of a good first impression of a character can influence that character's reception. This was even seen as late as Siege of Dragonspear, because while Imoen isn't in the game for most of the story, she's the only character who expresses genuine concern for the player and actively asks her not to go to Dragonspear Castle. Imoen remains unique in this regard, specifically because very few RPGs will actually do something like this. Really sit back and think, how many RPGs can you name where your first companion is an old childhood friend? Most RPGs, even later Bioware RPGs, will start the player off completely alone and have them run into an entire party's worth of complete strangers in very rapid succession. From Knights of the Old Republic, having you go through Terrace, recruiting Karth, Mission, Zalbar, T3, Bastila, and Candorus over the course of six hours as you plot to escape the Sith blockade, to Baldur's Gate 3, sprinkling the majority of them in the same square kilometer to all go, hey, I've got a brainworm too, we should travel together and maybe we'll find a cure in 35 hours with all the natural flow of chat GPT trying to flirt. And it's not like I'm just picking on Larian here, in their later years, Bioware really had a nasty habit of making your first string of companions be people who just absolutely hated your guts right from the start. Dragon Age is really bad about this. In the first game, you just pick up a group of randos off the street and go, you'll do, let's not get too attached to each other, with the notable exception of Morrigan, who actually does develop something of a friendship with the Grey Warden rather enthusiastically. For her own reason, sure, but it's better than nothing. Dragon Age Inquisition pairs you up with people who are all giving you the side eye and threatening you because you came out of the fade with a glowing hand trick. Dragon Age 2 is actually the only one to even suggest that Hawk had good relationships before the game started, with their surviving sibling, but that relationship is almost almost doomed to die for plot reasons and her entire family is killed throughout the game. Dragon Age is just a bad series in general, honestly. Truth be told, I blame the audience more than the developer. Dragon Age might drop the ball, but Mass Effect was usually pretty good at making your early roster being people who you had some kind of previous relationship with, or who were at the very least cordial with you. Your first squad mates in every game usually contains a human companion who has a great deal of respect for you, but in true fandom fashion, they're all decried as boring by the player base because they're not anywhere near as huge of personality as the rest of the crew. Jacob probably gets this the worst as he's the only one with his head on straight on a crew full of barely held together nut jobs. His loyalty mission isn't even all that dramatic, it's just really fucking racist. But because he's a human with his head on straight, and black, he became the most widely disliked companion in the entire franchise. Even more than Caden. On the opposite side of that coin, Mass Effect 2 and 3 are both very quick to put Garrus back into the party, who as a character is beloved to the point that he is pretty much the MON of that series. We're good, Perfect Commander. timing, Shepard. Gave me a clear shot at that bastard. You took him down clean. Sometimes you get lucky. Shepard. I thought you were dead. Garrus! What are you doing here? Just keeping my skill sharp. Nobody would give me a mirror. How bad is it? Hell, Garrus, you were always ugly. Slap some face paint on there and no one will even notice. <laughs> oh, oh, don't make me laugh. Damn it, my face is barely holding together as it is. Some women find facial scars attractive. Mind you, most of those women are Krogan. Make an exception. Just this once. Damn it. Quick, shoot them. Shoot them, you love them. Too slow. Kill you? No. But I don't mind slowing you down a little. Maybe give Seasick the blood trail to follow. Bastard! You're lucky. I wouldn't have shot you in the leg. I was told Harkin was one of the best. This better not happen again. Oh, it won't. Don't worry. 
What? Shit. Betrayal repaid Sidonis. Look at that. And they want my opinion on how to stop it? Failed CSEC officer, vigilante, and I'm their expert advisor? Think you can win this thing, Shepard? Yeah. I don't know, Garrus, but I'm sure as hell gonna give it my best shot. I'm damn sure nobody else can do it. For whatever it's worth, I'm with you. Welcome aboard. Long range, I wrote the book. Nobody alive can do this, not even Commander Shepard. Nobody alive, maybe. But technically, I died. Yeah, well, next time we'll throw in a herd of rampaging clicks, and that's how you separate the rookies from the pros. <laughs> and Shepard, forgive the insubordination, but this old friend has an order for you. Go out there and give them hell. You were born to do this. Goodbye, Garrus. And if I'm up there in that bar and you're not, I'll be looking down. I'll always have your back. Garrus's friendship and possible romance with Shepard is one of the highlights of Mass Effect, and you could argue that it's what makes the game work. If he dies in Mass Effect 2, his absence is felt throughout the third game. The whole series eventually comes to be more about this found family of space misfits than the wider galactic politics that form the framing device. And that's a great strength of the writing. I know this game is often considered to be badly written by people who don't like that it's not more about the wider global politics, or that the morality system is pretty simplistic, but I often feel those people are missing the forest for the trees in that regard. RPG companions often struggle against one main problem, and that's fandom. Really good companions don't take much to make. They just have to be charming. MON doesn't have a lot of writing that isn't fan-made, and she's one of the most beloved companions of all time. But if you have a character who is well-rounded, but by happenstance ends up saying something goofy or silly, the goofy or silly thing is all they're remembered for. In a previous video, I briefly spoke on the subject of inspirational flanderization, where one character is inspired by a previous character who then inspires the next, with the first character becoming more and more flanderized with each new generation, which I referred to as inbreeding because it's funnier that way. Flanderization is the result of this happening with a single character over a show's long run, as it builds a fan base which starts remembering only the most standout moments, and not appreciating the moments in between that made them stand out in the first place. So you get Ned Flanders, who was a relatively good-hearted person, but for whom religious was the only thing most people actually remembered about him. So over time, as old writers left and new writers who had grown up with The Simpsons came in, he became more and more of a judgmental Bible thumper. Flanders is the big example of Flanderization, the concept named after him after all, but nobody really stops to think about why this happens. And the truth is, this is just how fandom treats characters in slow motion. Take a grounded, well-rounded character, water them down to a more malleable two-dimensional versions of themselves and superimpose your own biases onto them. Fandom does this with damn near every character they get their hands on, and this affects how those characters are written because writers are often responding to what the audience likes and dislikes. When this is done by fans of a work taking inspiration from it for their own work, this character's stagnation is more visually apparent. When it comes to CRPGs, almost all of them are cribbing from Bioware. Even Bioware cribs from Bioware. You can take some Bioware companions and trace them along their catalog with only minor differences between the characters at best. And not just in personality, but in presentation. Take Jahira, an early game crutch companion who serves as a mentor and later romance option to the player, characterized by a strong will, a tendency to nag, and a viciousness when things get personal. Or Bastila, an early game crutch companion who serves as a mentor and later romance option to the player, characterized by a strong will, a tendency to nag, and viciousness when things get personal. Or Miranda Lawson, an early game crutch companion who serves as a mentor and later romance option to the player, characterized by a strong will, a tendency to nag, and a viciousness when things get personal. Most OG Bioware characters from Baldur's Gate or Knights of the Old Republic can be traced through a lineage this way, with the exception of most of the characters from the first Baldur's Gate who just didn't really have plot relevance at all. And the standout ones tend to be the ones who didn't so much have good dialogue as they had biting dialogue. Supplication. Perhaps it would be best if you desisted your efforts for the moment, me- I mean, master. This seems to be going nowhere. HK-47 is probably my favorite example, because he's probably Bioware's most memeable character. You know HK, right? He talks with tone indicators and says meatbag a lot. What you probably don't know is that you can actually go through an entire run of Knights of the Old Republic without him saying meatbag even once. In the first game, he is a far more grounded character, almost business-like in his presentation. Like, yes, I am an assassin droid. Say meatbag, 
Ma'am, I am a professional. I think I saw him say meatbag exactly once in the entire game, and he actually stopped himself from doing it because he was talking about Revan. In KOTOR 2, he really ramps up the meme dialogue. In the first game, when you talk to him, he just says, HK-47, ready to serve. In the second, he almost gleefully asks, is there someone you need killed, master? And he goes on about assassination like it's an art form, talking about killing as if he's the critic from Ratatouille. But he still has an interesting depth to him as he reveals that one of the reasons the Jedi have practically gone extinct is because assassins took advantage of their self-sacrificial nature. This isn't even a plot-relevant conversation, this is just a chat with your weird serial killer droid. Fast forward to the Old Republic and HK's wacky mimetic reputation has solidified itself to the point that they just make new versions of him that are increasingly flanderized. This isn't even a criticism of Bioware or Obsidian here, both those games have extremely well-written characters, some of which are the best the company has ever made. The games that gave us Kreia and Lana are honestly allowed to meme as long as they keep doing this, but it does highlight how HK-47's personality has been been worn down so much that everything that actually made statement die meatbag stand out has been lost to time. If an otherwise grounded character has a snarky one-liner once in a film, that becomes the thing the character is known for. This happened in the original Baldur's Gate with Minsk. In the first Baldur's Gate, his entire character is he has a head wound and here's his support animal. But his popularity exploded to the point that in the second game, without Dinah hair to bounce off of, his dialogue was filled with jokes about hamsters and butt kicking. He even starts inserting Boo into the conversation while Jahira is grieving the death of her husband, and that's where the creeping rot starts. The original party of Baldur's Gate 1 all come in pairs. They can't be separated in game by anything but death. Dinah Hare and her bodyguard Minsk, Jahira and her husband Khalid, and Garion's ward and her best friend Imowen. At the start of Baldur's Gate 2, all three of those pairs are broken up. Dinah Hare is dead before the game even starts, Khalid is found dead later in the first dungeon, and Imowen is captured once you make it out of the dungeon. All three of the remaining group are all coping with a deep loss, but only two of them get to do anything about it. Jahira's grief over Khalid makes up the majority of her banters with the player, and Garion's Ward's one-woman blood quest of love and friendship to rescue Imowen is what half the entire game is dedicated to. Minsk, however, seems to forget about Dinah Hare very quickly in the midst of making silly hamster jokes. And in the unfinished business mod, you can play a detailed side quest of Boo going missing, and Minsk devotes more more energy to saving Boo than thinking about Dinah Hare. This is especially egregious because before the enhanced editions, Dinah Hare was the only black woman you could have in your party in any of these games, and the fact that she's treated with such disregard by her own companion, who is only part of the default party because of his meme status, is pretty disgusting. Minsk has absolutely no reason to be here, and his presence in the story is only because the fans laughed when the guy with the hamster showed up. Minsk is such a mimetic icon that Larian Studios contrived a reason for him to be in the game long after he was supposed to have died, and had such a little regard for Minsk's character beyond the memes that they didn't even bother to get Jim Cummings back. They just foisted him off onto a voice actor who is also best known for doing memes. And this is especially noteworthy in a game that was already treating the good Baldur's Gate characters with malicious disdain. At least when they weren't holding them down and bloodily ripping them off. Look, Matt Mercer is a fine voice actor, and I have nothing against him, but I find his increasing ubiquity a little alarming at times, especially in a game that feels more inspired by Critical Role than any of the things you'd expect a Baldur's Gate sequel to be inspired by. Minsk, like most characters in Baldur's Gate 1, was enough of a character for the very open style that game was going for. Trying to carry him over to later games was always a bad move. It's like trying to carry over Jar, whose most defining lines are film quotes. Fandom tends to only remember the big standout things about a character and don't really give much credence to how the rest of that character's personality makes those moments work. And when those are the standout moments, they become the character. And so characters inspired by those characters become even more flanderized as a result. Characters can be very nuanced and interesting, but if they don't funny man, enough, or they don't fit the right vibe, that character is just ignored. I actually really like Caden Alenko, because he's a character with a lot to say, is generally quite interesting, and in the third game really comes into his own as a companion. You'll learn a lot about the issues the Alliance has with Biotics by talking to him, and his conflicts with Shepard in the second game over working for Cerberus have more weight than Ashley just because Caden always comes off as not really mad, just disappointed. Caden's a really interesting character if you bother taking the time to really soak him in. It also helps I really like 
like his voice actor. Raphael Sparge also did the voice of Karth and Nassi, who Caden often feels like the more polished version of. I like Karth, but one issue I've always had with both him and Bastila is that it's impossible to say anything to either of them without them interpreting it as an attack and biting your head off. It's a little off-putting, that's not the case in Mass Effect and I'm glad about it. But because he's one of the few characters that doesn't get a big memeable character moment, he's decried as boring. Most people tend to pick Ashley over Caden to survive Vermeer because Ashley is romanceable and they like Kimberly Brooks' voice acting more. And no shade to those people, that's a perfectly fine reason to take Ashley. I love Kimberly Brooks too. But it's telling how few people really give a character time to sit with them if they aren't romanceable or memeable. Baldur's Gate 3 has a character much like Caden, and in fact he's the best written character in the game. When you first meet him, he has the best first impression of any of the companions because he vaults over a cliff during a siege like Errol Flynn, kills a goblin, flourishes his weapon, and gives a really cheesy one-liner that feels reminiscent of like old swashbuckling movies. Immediately, you meet him and think, oh, he's so cool. And the first thing I did getting into the Druid Enclave was find him and talk to him and realize he's actually a big noble softy. He's after Carlac, looking to kill her for being an evil demon, but once he finds out that he's being played by his patron, he starts really reconsidering a deal that had so far been going pretty well for him. In general, Will is the best written, most interesting character in the game because he has a lot to say, but he's often ignored by the fan base because well, because of racism, but also because he's just not as huge of personality as the rest of the cast. Astarian has a much bigger personality, being a cross between Stewie Griffin and Preminger. Even though she treats me coldly, it's a sign of inner fire, for inside she's thinking, how can I refuse? And as a result, he has a much bigger fan base of simps, despite his character being as deep as a puddle. Will can't be memed the way the rest of the characters can, he's much harder to pigeonhole. I honestly do not care for Baldur's Gate 3. Having played the original games multiple times, I'm aware of the depths to which Larian not only throws scorn on them, but lifts from them and their characters. But whichever set of writers got to decide Will's story were the real MVPs on that development team. While I mentioned Knights of the Old Republic 2 managed to do interesting things with HK-47, it also suffered from a terminal illness called Developed by Obsidian. So all their original companions are different flavors of bitter, or traumatized, or angry, and they all hurl venom at everyone on the ship, except for the Exile because she's a special force black hole that draws people into her orbit. I don't think Obsidian has ever learned learned what variety is. The first game actually had really unique and interesting takes on classic Star Wars tropes. Candorous Ordo is the first and only time Mandalorians have ever been interesting, because his philosophy about battle is compelling to listen to. Mission Veo is the archetypal Han Solo type, but she's a really optimistic and good-hearted teenager with a heart of gold, and also the single most powerful character in the entire game. Bastila and Jolie Bindo were making biting critiques of the Jedi long before Kreia was even a sperm in Chris Avalon's nuts. And they give those critiques from the perspective of a Padawan who is deeply confused with the decisions of her KG masters, and an old man yelling at those darn Jedi kids to get off his lawn. What was always telling is that these criticisms are given so succinctly. The Jedi, with their damnable sense of over-caution, would tell you love is something to avoid. Thankfully, anyone who's even partially alive knows that's not true. The Jedi forbidding love is one of the most frequently criticized aspects of the Order, even in-universe. If anything, the Jedi's ban on relationships and the fear of discovery it creates in its students has been indirectly responsible for more catastrophes. And Jolie presents this with such a casual air as if its certainty is self-evident. It says something about how those outside the Order really feel about the Jedi. Jolie Bindo is such an interesting character. It helps that he's voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, who gets to play a softer spoken character for once. I'm so used to him doing his deepest baritone possible. I had no idea he could sound this comforting. It's always nice when you get to see a side of a voice actor you were previously unaware of. The only character in KOTOR 2 to come even close to this in presentation and performance is Kreia, the nihilistic schemer who is quick to talk the meaning of the Force and its relation to things outside the Jedi and the Sith, as well as hurl derision in equal measure to both orders without hesitation. Kreia is probably the most high 
highly praised aspect of this game, she's truly an interesting character, but she's also the only interesting character. Atten Rand, your resident Han Solo type and Kreia's counterpart, has gone right back to the bitter and cynical views of his predecessor. He certainly has more depth of character than Mission had, but this is a video whose primary subject is a character who is defined by lack of depth, and that being what makes her so beloved. Learning about Atten's past and how he was an assassin and torturer for Darth Revan is compelling the first time, but all it really does is provide a roundabout route for why the Han Solo character is acting like Han Solo. Most of the characters in KOTOR 2 who aren't just returning from the previous game are like this. Bitter, angry, and jaded. That's interesting for one or two characters, but it stops being interesting when it's every character especially when they're all overshadowed by Kreia. And it's especially true when you factor in Obsidian's preferred writing style, which is to go on long-winded rants about philosophy as they literally beat you over the head with their main theme. So interesting characters tend to take a back seat in their games. I know Obsidian is something of a darling among RPG fans, but I often feel their games could stand to be a little less oppressively bleak. I've spoken a lot about archetypes in this video, how companions in RPGs will often be pigeonholed into tropes so they can be lumped together. Bioware companions are almost doomed to have this happen to them, but it's usually done by fans. When fans try to lump Bioware companions into archetypes, they almost always do it poorly. Here's one graphic I stole from Reddit from a user who will mercifully remain nameless, trying to name the Bioware archetypes. Among the stellar entries here include one described as basically just Han Solo, and then not including any characters that are actually like Han Solo, placing all the female characters the creator doesn't like into the bitch, having Wise Mentor be filled by a character who dies before they can do any mentoring, and a cranky old man whose entire gimmick is that he's not actually wise at all and then having the murderous psychopath decidedly not include HK-47. But the one that stood out to me was Naive Minx, which is described as an innocent, wide-eyed, socially clumsy romance option who is also LGBT-friendly and will totally bone the player if you're nice to them. Among the chosen characters is Mission Veo, who isn't naive, is extremely street smart, her entire story is about how everyone underestimates her to their own peril, is not a romance option in Knights of the Old Republic at all, and is 14 years old. Well, now I see why you wrote, look at her, she's so wide-eyed, so innocent, so trusting. Is there something you'd like to share with the class, Mr. Redditor? All of these entries are completely terrible, and it speaks to the desire of the creator to pigeonhole these characters without being able to actually figure out where they belong and going entirely off a surface level reading of the character, and the rest is just conjecture. The thing is, if you were to try and put Imoen into an archetype, where would you put her? What characters is Imoen similar to? The aforementioned Mission and Leliana are common comparisons, because they're all perky thieves with upbeat personalities, but the truth is, outside of the general vibe, they have little in common. Mission is actually an optimistic take on Han Solo, and Leliana feels like what Imoen would be if Baldur's Gate was written in the gritty reboot era, which is far removed from Forgotten Realms circa 1997. Imoen is nothing like any other bio character or any other RPG companion at all, and most comparisons to such are surface level at best. But there is one character that she actually does remind me of, another character who is defined almost entirely by a deep and abiding love for their friend, and will stick with their friend even into the very depths of hell. Let it go! I'll have you, long shanks! Hey. Mr. Frodo's not going anywhere without me. No, indeed, it is hardly possible to separate you even when he is summoned to a secret council, and you are not. Go back, Sam! I'm going to Mordor alone. Of course you are! And I'm coming with you! I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. A promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. I'm sorry, Sam. I don't know why I said that. I do. It's the ring. You can't take your eyes off it. It's me. It's your Sam. Don't you know your Sam? That there's some good in this world, Mr. Fertile. And it's worth fighting for. Like a stuck pig! Not if I stick you first. Sam! Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you. But I can carry you! Come on! 
Show you that go. I'm not the first person to point out that fantasy, and especially fantasy RPGs, have ripped from Tolkien so many times that it officially qualifies as a paper shredder. But out of all the characters and concepts that Tolkien pioneered, Samwise Gamgee is surprisingly the most appreciated and the one for whom the least inspiration is taken. Though truth be told, I don't think most people really appreciated Sam until the Peter Jackson films released. But Sam's motivations for going on the quest alongside Frodo was born of nothing more than sincere love for his friend. Indeed, a lot of the more impactful changes from the book seem to exist purely to refocus Sam as the one who is keeping Frodo going. It speaks true to how Imoen is largely on this adventure for your sake, how her primary motivation has always been to stick with her friend. I mentioned this at the start, but in Baldur's Gate, companions' opinions of the party is based on reputation. Let your reputation get too low, and companions with a good alignment will voice their disgust of you and leave. Get too high, and companions with an evil alignment will call you cringe and bail. Even as you get close to their breakpoint, they start voicing objections. Imoen is unique in that despite having a neutral good alignment, she will never leave the party no matter how low your reputation is, because she cares about you. At the start of the first game, she claims to have snuck into Garion's room to read one of his letters, and that motivated her decision to follow you. Garion's letter is something you receive at the end of Chapter 6, which tells you that you were a ball spawn. Imowen knew what you were the whole time and went after you out of concern. That's a far cry from how any other character reacts to learning the player is a ball spawn. It's touching, and all of it goes unsaid. Imowen also has no real conflicts with other characters. Granted, it isn't until Throne of Ball she even gets real banter, but she can get along with even the most evil characters in the game and can be sticky with any of them. Because again, a friend of yours is a friend of hers. Even if you're evil, even if you plan to become the new Lord of Murder, she still loves you anyway. You're the closest thing I have to family. I love you. I'm healing, but you need to heal too. Not just from fighting Saravok. Those are just cuts and scars, but in coming to terms with, you know, what you are, let someone else take care of the Shining Lady, please. What you need and currently lack is focus. Forgive me, Duke Janath, it's just, it's hard. My best friend is charging into a dragon's mouth, and I'm just sitting here thinking about magic and stuff. It's such a simple and yet powerful motivation for a character. Here is someone not out for personal gain, not out for fame or glory, not out to save her own hide, She's out here because she's worried about you. The way that has always quietly resonated with people is demonstrated in how modders have always treated her. There are two really big mods designed entirely around showing Imowen the love she deserves. Imowen Forever by Jaitsi lets her remain in the party during Siege of Dragonspear and the second chapter of BG2, and gives her all the banter dialogue she was missing before, mostly with the player. I've played the Siege of Dragonspear portion of it, it's really good. Imowen Romance by Israel Blar and TC Dale is a full-on character experience expansion, elevating her to co-protagonist status, giving her tons of dialogue, and exploring her anguish over her time in Spellhold, and even going as far as to give her equal importance to the player during Throne of Ball. It even lets her form a romantic relationship with either Aerie or Garion's ward, and yes, I'm aware of what that implies, let's just ignore that for now. Both of these mods are true labors of love for Imowen, a kind of labor of love no other companion has ever gotten. The latter of these two was worked on for 10 years before it finally saw full completion, first releasing in 2003 with its final final update being released in 2019. These just aren't things you do for a character that didn't resonate with you. That they're both considered among the best mods for the series is a testament to that. It's oftentimes astounding how such a simple concept and character has such an impact on so many people. The best part about all of this is that it's reciprocal. Regardless of alignment, Garion's ward isn't a particularly noble person. Her goals are always personal, and her motivations in most games are usually revenge. Despite being the hero of Baldur's Gate, she didn't join the Flaming fist in attacking Kalar Argent's crusade until the crusade took a swing at her and Imowen. She got out of it alive, but Imowen was poisoned and rendered unconscious. And this is immediately after a conversation that involved her expressing to Imowen that she can't bear the thought of anything happening to her. And then something does happen to her. Immediately that provokes a visceral reaction from the player. Nope. That is too fucking far. This is ramped up even further in Shadows of Om. Imowen spends half the game being tortured by Irenicus after being captured by the Cald Wizards. The entire first half of the game is about gathering the funds to rescue her. And that goal is omnipresent. Every companion recruited, every quest accepted, she can reinforce that she is trying to mount a rescue mission to save her friend. This is only compounded by the fact that it's because of her that Imowen got roped into this in the first place. She wouldn't have been captured if she hadn't come along on this journey. In the first game, Imowen's devotion to her friend is 
is understated. In the second, the ward's devotion to Imowen is explicitly stated and constantly present. Unless you're a monster and picking the abuse of dialogue options, there isn't a single moment between them where the genuine love they have for each other isn't plainly on display, even if it isn't through dialogue. As understated as it all is, it's genuinely touching just how much of this story is about these two friends cherishing each other, especially given how during Shadows of Om we learn that Imowen is a ball spawn. They aren't just friends, they're sisters. It isn't until Throne of Ball that this gets unpacked, as so far the ward has rejected any notion of the other ball spawn being her siblings. But it's in one small bit of dialogue that Imowen really gets to the heart of it. It's good to see you again, little sister. <laughs> I rather enjoy calling you that. So, you ready to go? I'd prefer to travel with you if I could. They find out that they're siblings, and they're like, This is great! This is the first time Ball has given us any good news. I genuinely adore that. We often see stories where characters who are very close friends will refer to each other as being like siblings, but when was the last time you saw one where they then followed that to the logical endpoint of just being siblings? Especially when there's this amount of genuine and sincere love practically oozing out of the game's pores, much of it completely by accident. This kind of thing is usually read as romantic, and you can mod the game to make it so, but even RPG romance doesn't get this implicitly heartfelt and touching. If I had to guess as to why we don't see this kind of character more often, it's because it largely orients itself around a pre-existing relationship, and there seems to be this unspoken rule in CRPGs that you're not allowed to impose characterization onto the protagonist independent of the player. Even if you're someone who dislikes Imowen, the closeness that the player and her have is always implied no matter how rude you are to her. Even when you're trying to insist that you're raising funds to take revenge on a wizard who tortured you, the option to say you're trying to rescue your friend is right there. Rescuing Imowen or getting payback on her behalf is the driving motivation behind half of the campaigns. A lot of players seem to want to project completely and utterly onto the protagonist, and giving them pre-existing relationships is often considered a big no-no. This is ironic, honestly, as not only are the best RPGs the ones that flagrantly disregard that notion, but RPGs that try to abide by it are strangely even more pushy. In Baldur's Gate 3 alone, every potential companion you run into will just conclude, oh yeah, we should stick together because we have the same same brain worms, apropos of nothing. I mean, Lazel, I kinda get, the two of you fought together, and maybe Shadowheart if you freed her on the ship, but the rest of them all just come to the conclusion of, well, what else are we gonna do? This is an RPG what we're having. I mean, just the first few companions you run into always feels unbelievably awkward. If you didn't get Shadowheart out of the pod, she sneers at you like a teenager before going, oh wait, same brain worm, let's team up. You run into a Starian and he pulls a fucking knife on you before going, oh wait, same brain worm, let's team up. Then, just just to put the icing on the cake, you walk by a stone and pull a companion out of it who is like, oh hey, same brain worm, let's team up. This is like if in Baldur's Gate 2 you recruited Edwin by just finding him in a cupboard. I'm I get the feeling that someone at Larian really had a boner for Shadowheart because you have to turn her away several times and then kill her just so she'll leave you alone, and even then the game shoves her little d20 into your hands anyway. But in true Larian fashion, because Larian generally doesn't like giving the player information until the 11th hour, you have no idea what this thing even is or why it's important until near the end of the game. And if by some strange miracle you actually liked Shadowheart and didn't drop her off a cliff, the entire story involves a long-form character assassination of one of the most beloved characters characters in the previous games. One major criticism of Beamdog's work on the Enhanced Editions is that their content always struggled to take no for an answer from the player. Their presumption is that because it's new content, you shouldn't be able to skip it easily. And that's always been a lesson Larian refused to learn. The notion of player freedom is always illusory. At some point, you're going to have to get on with the main quest. This is true in actual D&D unless your dungeon master is a spineless wimp who won't tell the bard, no, you can't seduce the Ravager. But oftentimes, games that pride themselves on being able to make choices and direct the story your way are often way more pushy than games that say, yeah, here's the story, the protagonist is not literally you, fucking deal with it, bitch. One of the reasons Larian games are often so insistent and pushy is because they fail to establish a real motivation for the player to do anything. The player is often kept in the dark in Larian games, shunted around by other people, telling them where to go, and being told, I'll explain later. Baldur's Gate 3 will invent entire paragraphs of plot reasons to keep Shadowheart in your party. Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, the reason to keep Imowen is that she's cute and sweet and she's here to support you in your time of need, and who doesn't want a friend like that? This video is kind of turning into me shitting on Baldur's Gate 3, and for that I apologize, but it does often frustrate me how in the conversation about RPG companions and how they've changed for the worse, Larian continues to provide the best examples of this. I don't understand why they front load such a pack of assholes onto you. I don't understand why all the good characters are mutually exclusive to one another. I don't understand why they copied so much from Baldur's Gate 2, yet at the same time clearly showed they didn't get it. If there was ever a game I would expect would understand the importance of having a character like Imowen, it would be the game that is literally a sequel to the game that gave us Imowen. You can't even pull the different developer card because other developers have made Baldur's Gate games, and for all their faults they at least understood the assignment in this regard. You're the closest thing I have to family. I love you. Truthfully though, I'm just forced to accept one rather simple, unavoidable truth. The audience has just changed. Fantasy has changed. RPGs have changed. My biggest criticism of Baldur's Gate 3 is that it feels more like critical role fanfiction than it does an RPG or even a sequel to Baldur's Gate 2. But to the people for whom this is their first Baldur's Gate game, that's a positive. It's part of why they like it so much. They like that they don't have to play the old games with their ugly graphics. They like that all the characters are designed to be pin-ups first, blow-up dolls second, and people third. They like that the game has more options for lesbian romance than the previous games, where you're options were limited to a vampire with no dialogue or your sibling. Actually, no, I like that part too. I just realized reading that, it sounded like I was implying that the corpse or incest dilemma was better. No, no, it's not. It's definitely not. Baldur's Gate 3 can have that W. The idea of playing a game that old that looks the way it does and plays with the older, more complicated rule set and has a slower, less exciting story is just not appealing to a lot of people. Baldur's Gate's biggest strength in both plot and companions was that even when the stakes were high, the story was still a personal journey. It isn't until thrown a ball that things start ramping up to city sieges that leave the bodies of the innocent in their wake. Today, that's how most RPGs start. Fantasy games in particular spend more time in Helm's Deep than they do the Shire. The stakes keep rising, and the audience demands that the stakes keep rising. In that environment, a game where you start off knowing nothing, and you and your best friend have to go and find your aunt and uncle who take you under their wing as you investigate an unrelated but secretly related iron crisis, is just too slow. It's not action-packed enough. This isn't just in RPG. I found this adrenaline high in other places, mostly animation, where big orchestral soundtracks next to big particle effects laden fight scenes is considered the height of storytelling. And I used to rail really hard against this. I used to try so damn hard to get people to accept that quieter moments and more even tones and less intensity makes for more satisfying stories, better characters, and better themes. But it's never stuck outside of a few people. I've just accepted that this is the case. It's been the core nibbling at me as to why I find myself hating more and more RPGs. RPGs and turning away from the genre, why I'm finding the casts of companions these games provide increasingly insufferable, and why I'm increasingly heading back to older games that were made before tropes became codified and technology limitations meant the writers had to be more clever. The companions are just a small piece of this. I've had an increasing amount of grievances with the genre for a long time, especially with how long-winded some of these games can get. I may lament the fact that we don't get characters like Imowen anymore, how despite her seeming lack of depth and independent motivations, she truly does leave a more lasting impact than any other companion character I've ever seen, and how writing has gotten away from characters like this to focus on making snarky snark boys for Twitter to drool over. But at least I got Imowen at all. I suppose it's a sort of twisted blessing, because the lack of characters like Imowen has only served to make her stand out more. The lack of characters taking inspiration from Imowen has meant she hasn't had the chance to be flanderized. Despite how much of Baldur's Gate 2 is picked clean by vultures, there's always something to come back to that makes it uniquely special. I mentioned earlier that modders spent 10 years perfecting a full-on character expansion for Imowen, and I want to talk about what is probably the climax of that story. During Chapter 6 of Shadows of Am, after you've finished the rest of the story talks for the mod, you get a scene where everyone makes camp and Imowen nervously plays a lute and sings for the entire camp. It's a very quiet moment amidst all the drama. After getting out of the Underdark and after fighting through a small army of drow, you're still missing your soul, Irenicus is still a threat, but you all just take a moment to take a break anyway. The next morning, Imowen wakes the player up by splashing a bucket of water on her, and that prompts a chase that ends in a tickle fight in the grass. It's a truly touching and heartfelt moment as both of them have lost their souls, and their own death could be on the horizon for all they know, and Grind's ward is struggling with controlling the Slayer. And yet here they are, Two ball spawn rolling in the grass, laughing and playing like happy children. It's a moment of touching levity in a story that has been punctuated by loss and grief. It's without words, well without dialogue, 
repudiates what most of the Forgotten Realms lore often claims about the children of Baal. Even without their souls, even dying of a horrible curse, they still manage to find joy. This is what a mod considered important enough to be the climactic moment of its story, and everything after that is one prolonged denouement. I don't think I've ever encountered a moment in an RPG more touching than this, and it's something a lot of writers would consider beneath them. Too saccharine, too childish. But in a story that has so far been drenched in grief and pain, that kind of childishness is sorely needed. Maybe I'm just old and simple-minded, but stuff like this has always left a more lasting impact on me than showing me the sheer depths of depravity a character can get to when pushed hard enough. After years of having to watch people drown works in praise when they torment and torture their characters the way they do, the whole thing just seems gross. So the next time you find yourself ready to praise a game for how dark and tragic it gets, or how it combs the depths of depravity and evil, I want you to picture two ball spawn, two demigod avatars of murder and death, coping with loss and pain by laughing like children during a tickle fight, taking a brief moment to forget the world and experiencing a small bit of the joy that had been so cruelly ripped away from them.